Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. When we talk about the heavy hitters in American letters today, James McBride is up there. His books, whether we're talking about The Color of Water, The Good Lord Bird, Deacon King Kong, or Heaven and Earth Grocery Store, they are acclaimed by critics, awarded by his peers, and, to put it bluntly, they sell. So it makes sense that at the National Book Festival earlier this year, hosted by the Library of Congress, he was given the 2024 Prize for American Fiction. And at that book fest, he spoke with NPR's Michelle Martin in front of a live audience and talked about his career and how his writing is influenced by music. That's coming up. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Stars, presenting the new series, Three Women. Based on the best-selling book by Lisa Tadeo, Three Women follows a writer played by Shailene Woodley, who persuades three spectacular, ordinary women to tell her their stories, and her relationships with them change the course of her life forever. Starring Shailene Woodley, Betty Gilpin, DeWanda Wise, and Gabrielle Creevy. Watch the season premiere of Three Women now, only on Stars and the Stars app. All right, before we get started, you should know that James McBride and Michelle Martin have some shared background together. They worked at the Washington Post at the same time. And it's easy to forget that McBride's background is in journalism until the part of the interview where he talks about uh, keeping a notebook on him at all times, you know, jotting notes and observations about the people around him. And like a good journalist, Michelle asks him to hand it over. Here's Michelle. We first, I think, first thought of you as a creator. I mean, look, you went to journalism school. You worked at the Washington Post. Actually, we kind of overlapped there, although we never saw each other, because I was in the metro section and you were at style section, so you were in high cotton. You know, I was just out here right. doing police blotter. But, um, but, but I think creatively, I think you kind of first thought of yourself as a saxophone player, correct? Would that be right? right? As yeah, a musician, yeah. right? A musician, yeah so, yeah. so when did you say to yourself... I'm a writer. Um, well, probably after I left the Post. You know, I left the Post, it was 89 maybe, or 90. I came to New York and, and um, I, can't, I, I left the Post, I can't remember, I think it was maybe 88. And then went to New York and I became a full-time musician for several years. And during that time, I wrote The Color of Water. And I, when I wrote The Color of Water, you know, I made so much money from writing the book, I just, maybe I should stop playing these gigs because, you know, <laughs> You know, traveling and, you know, going out and, you know, going to Gary, Indiana in a van and coming back with five bucks, you know. And everything I had was made in the truck stop, you know. So I just, I, I just realized that, you know, I had a, a talent for writing. I mean, I, you know, I, I realized I had a talent for it before, but I, I started taking it more seriously, I guess, after I left the Post. Because creatively, fiction started to show itself. I was going to ask about that because the first mark you made was with memoir, was with The Color of Water, which to this day, I mean, I think, do, do people still read it in, in school, right? Right? You, it's just, it's finding its audience over and over again. People seem to find it when they need to find it, right? But it's, it's memoir. So when did the fiction start to show itself? Well, I, I always liked fiction, even as a, um, when I was a student at Oberlin. In fact, my, when I... I realized I had a talent for writing. I had a teacher named Tom Taylor who was, he was like an adjunct or he was visiting. Still remember his name and I wrote a story in this class. I had to go into class for like, because I wasn't really up to speed to Oberlin, which is, you know, I'm very grateful to that school where they had a, a, a class where you, if you didn't up to speed, they would get you to speed. And I had to write a story in that class and I wrote a story and after, he, afterwards he said, you know, you, you have a talent for this. And I said, you know, because the story I wrote was about a guy who went to the bathroom and, and sat on the toilet and had a heart attack. <laughs> but he had a flashback, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, <laughs> I don't know what he saw in that, but I was, you know, I'm hoping he didn't see everything that I was seeing. But um, so, I, you know, I, I guess I just always started writing creatively, mm-hmm. but it, none of it was any good. Um, I I was talking about this morning, I went to see the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. When I was a reporter at the Post, in fact, I took my two nephews there. And after we left, one of my nephews, he was so upset by seeing the animals that I wrote a story called Mr. Whippy and the Wind, which is part of the short story collection in uh, Five Carat Soul, which I see like eight people read. But um, (laughs) but I was... I read it. Oh, you did? God bless you. Loyal. (laughs) 
loyal fan. In any fan. case, so uh, <laughs> oh, you know, I've always been creative in music. You know, journalism wasn't creative enough for me. And um, and also, fiction allows your dreams to come true, whereas uh, journalism doesn't. Although, like, it's starting to a little bit now. But that's a whole other you know, whole other thing. <laughs> I will say this, you know, as a mixed race person, mm -hmm. well, first of all, if you can name me one African American who's not mixed, I'll give you $100 right now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for years when the color of water came out, when I was growing up, you know, we were, we were way out. We were considered way out. You know, you and I, we, we grew up around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mixed race family in those days was just something that was very unusual. But in the black community, was easily accepted. Mm -hmm. So, I'm happy to see that, you know, in a lot of ways my success is predicated on the fact that people are starting to see the reality that I've always known, which is that what difference does it make? Really. In the, in a great, in the grand scheme of things. So, um, that's probably why I'm here and, and why I'm getting this $10,000, you know? I mean, Wait, oh. they paid you? What? Wait, wait, what? <laughs> no, look, I, I'm not here. You can here. soundproof not, another room. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've made enough money. I'm here because I want to be here. Yeah. And because I respect librarians and the Library of Congress. And, uh, and, and all the, your fans who want to see you, of, of whom there well, seem to be quite a few. This is a little bit this is upsetting because if these people think I'm smart, something's wrong. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say anything. I mean, but... Um, I yeah. want to talk about the, the thing about your work, and, and one of the people, I know you don't read your reviews, but one of the people who wrote a review of one of your books talked about how he was reading the book on the subway and was laughing out loud, and everybody kept looking at him like, what's wrong with you? And, and has anybody, have you all done that? Have you ever done that? Is the voices in your books are all so different. Does that, you know, I mean, they all have their own voice. Like I was rereading Good Lord Bird when I realized that we were going to be talking. I reread it. The voices are so distinct. I'm like, how do these voices come to you? I mean, I, I, you know, I just happen to be the person in the room that holds a handkerchief when God coughs, honestly. I like people. You know, I listen to people. And part of my job is to listen to people. And, um, and I, I appreciate people so much. And I, I you know, I, I, I happen to look to the kindness in people. And when you look to the kindness in people, you see their depth. And so there's no bad people to me. And if you appreciate people, music helps you a lot. Because music forces you to listen. And so when I teach writing to my students, I often make them listen to music. And I make them walk around and watch and see. Because, you know, everywhere you go, everywhere I go, I always carry a notebook. I carry it everywhere. You know, I always carry a notebook. Because people are just handing me money when they talk. <laughs> so I always have a notebook. I always Can have I see pens. It? Is you, know. it, you got anything in there? Let me see. I want to see yeah, what's in well, there. Yeah, I mean, just I ignore see. the grocery list and stuff. But, okay. Uh, I mean, I wanna, like, um, let's, well, let's all right. hand it over. Pay for, okay, solution for tree. Address to frame for rush picks. Yeah, I, I, I co-sign that. Well, I okay, have... Okay, I could see it. I, I can, vitamins, I'm not going to ask about that. Set, okay, all right. Wait a minute, no, no, well, I'll give you the good section here. Because this, this, um, um, this book is a, a, a bit of a, an anomaly because I, I just graduated to a bigger book. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so salsa is what comes out of Goya cans. That's what I heard someone say. Um, and here's some types of music, uh, of, of Latin music. Zutalan, Montua, Mambo, Montuño, Mona, Montuña, um, the original tambo, three-string guitar with strings, G, C, E. See, I mean, this is useless to people. But if I'm, if I'm writing about Latin music, because I, I heard a, 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 just a gifted arranger, there was a workshop I was at, and this 
Latin cat. When I say Latin, I mean, I, with all due respect, I'm gonna, you know, Chicano. I don't know what he was, but he was Puerto Rican, and we say in New York. Right. He definitely was Puerto Rican. Right. But his, his, right. his language, his use of the, the, these terms was just fascinating because, you know, he, had, he figured out that all this, the African parts that came mm-hmm. into so called Latin, he had worked it out. He was a big fat guy, bad dude. I mean, he wasn't, he was obese. But so I, I just learned something, so I wrote it in my little book. But I have a, I have a, I just yeah. graduated to a bigger book. Because I, I usually keep sayings in one section, names in another section, and incidents that happen in another section. And then there's a little section with, you know, I go to the grocery store and get, you know. Get frames for the rush picks. The, right. um, but, you know, you, there was nobody you could consult to hear how a 19th century abolitionist vigilante could talk, right? Or an escaped, or not escaped, he wasn't really escaped. You all remember the story of Good Lord Bird. It focuses on... Onion, and he gets that name because it's a whole thing about how he gets that name. And he encounters John Brown, and John Brown liberates him, and it's told through him. And it's sort of based on, you know, the real John Brown, but it's hilarious. And I just, I'm just trying to think, how could you figure out that, like, this John Brown who was hanged for trying to start a, an insurrection against slavery could be hilarious? I mean, I just, that part. Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Life is how you look at it. I mean, if, if you can get over the fact that, you know, we've had, you know, in the last three, in the last, you know, from 2016 to 2020, we've, we had, you know, we had some awful things happen. I'll put it this way. In my church, you know, my pastor happens to be here. Not my pastor. I like when people say, my pastor. He's not your pastor, buddy. Okay? You cut it out. But the people, <laughs> the people that... I grew up knowing and that you grew up knowing. Mm-hmm. They always saw the bright side of stuff. They knew they were powerless to do stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they knew the mayor didn't care and that the city councilmen were just rascals, most of them, you know, in those days anyway. So they just learned to laugh because learning to laugh is a way of survival. And so even with John Brown, as, as ridiculous and as crazy as he was, because Calvinists are a little bit crazy, um, and so I grew up in a family and, and in a community where laughter was really the best medicine. And so I just try to put it into my books, you know. What's interesting, too, is, you know, a lot of people who write fiction, they start with memoir and then they build out. So you started with memoir, but then your next projects were very different from your life. Like, you, you know... I, Unless you well, you can't you, write the same. I mean, you can't write yeah. the same book again and again. I know some writers do that, you know, but I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in growth. I want to change. I want to evolve. You know, I, I'm 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 always trying to figure out what's the next. You know, I'd, I'd love to write a book where you open it up and the characters pop out and they talk to each other, and then you allow you're allowed to insert yourself into, it, and then you you turn the page. And I, I mean, I'm I'm trying to get. I just I can't stop being creative, you know. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm I'm limited really by books and music because there's no real neither side music and in, in the in music industry and the publishing industry they really don't understand each other. They don't know what to do with someone like me. I'm not a, I'm not you know I'm not your typical uh, writer who just writes the same book about detectives or whatever and someone gets killed. I'm, I'm always thirsty for something, and music is the same way. I'm always looking for something new and something, a different sound. And um, I've never found a comfortable place there. Books is just, that's just part of who I am. I'm just a creative person. You know, I'm just under the umbrella of creativity and storytelling, which has evolved to, in some ways that are good, in some ways that are not good. Mm -hmm. 10 second stories in TikTok don't really, that's not story, that's just film. And blogs and, and, uh, and YouTube channels are just, that's just, that's not even typing, you know? So um, I'm trying to figure out ways to engage people so that when, when someone tells their story, that it has some purpose to help someone else. This message comes from Schwab. With Schwab Investing Themes, it's easy to invest in ideas you believe in, like online music and videos, artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, and more. Schwab's research uncovers emerging trends, then their technology curates relevant stocks into over 40 themes to choose from. Schwab Investing Themes is not intended to be investment advice or a recommendation of any stock or investment strategy. Visit schwab.com slash thematic investing. Hey, Andrew here. 
In this section of the interview, Michelle and James go deep on James McBride's latest novel, The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. If you haven't read it yet, don't worry, there aren't any spoilers, but you should know it's about a Pennsylvania neighborhood occupied by immigrant Jews and black Americans and the woman with a disability who runs the grocery store there. Here's Michelle again. I felt like when I read it and when I heard you talk about it that you'd actually been carrying this story with you for some time. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. And, and part of it, because when I worked at a camp for, to, for disabled or so-called differently able kids, it changed my life. And that camp was run by a man who was, you know, in those years, and was, was gay and had to hide it. Um, and he was just, he just cha- he changed my life and the life of all of the people who worked at the camp. Um, that camp was kind of like a United Nations. It was outside Philly. It was called Variety Club Camp for Handicapped Children. It was started by uh, theater owners, uh, Jewish theater owners, for, for Jewish kids with polio. Then they opened it up to anybody with polio. And then they opened it up to anybody who was so-called differently abled. And a lot of those kids, um, I'm still in touch with, with like three of them now. And so I always wanted to write about it and write about him. But every time I wrote about it, it just was like sappy and it just it was just, it was corny. And, but the only chapter that worked, I wrote several chapters, you know, but the only chapter that worked was the chapter about the guy who kind of started the camp or whose life inspired the camp, which was Moshe. When I got to Moshe and then, you know, Chona, his wife, you know, well, wife-to-be, or Hannah, if you, you know, if you want to get all technical, um, when she got involved, when they got involved and they fell in love, then the story just, you know, the story got, it just, the plane took off the runway. What made this the time to bring that story forward? Since, like I say, you had been carrying pieces of it with you. Why do you think it presented itself when it did? It, there's no time. It's just, you know, that's the thing with fiction. Fiction, you know, fiction, you just go around gathering information and then it comes when it's supposed to. So... That was just God coming into the room. I mean, I, I was going to see Penhurst. I, I said it initially in Pottsville, PA, which is in Western PA near Pittsburgh. Um, but then I was going to see Penhurst, which is the old institution where they house disabled children. And again, remember, I was looking into, I wanted to write about a child or children who were disabled or differently able and what happens to them. So I was going to see Penhurst, which is closed, but I went to see it anyway and I saw a sign that said Potts Town. So I said, well, you know, Pottsville, Pottstown, you know, tomato, tomato, whatever. <laughs> so I drove into Pottstown and I looked around. And I said, this is perfect. It, you know, it still looked a little bit like it might have looked in the 30s. And then I started doing research. And I said, I'll set it here, right down the road from Penhurst. And, uh, and the rest just, just came from research and, and my imagination. You know, seeing the, so there was an old Jewish synagogue there. There was a Baptist church still there, building's still there, everything's different now, but, and then I just called on, you know, the gods of imagination to allow these characters to inhabit my brain, and then they begin to take off, and then you follow them once they get moving. I remember when writers used to say this when I was young, they'd say, my characters are, I'm following her, and I go, yeah, right, buddy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got a bridge I want to say, you too, sucker, but it's true. <laughs> At, at a certain point, the characters start to take, you know, they, they start to move. And in the case of this book, when Moshe and Shona, when he fell in love with her and she began to inhabit the pages, the other characters from her life began, began to emerge. Nate and Addie, you know, the black couple, and of course Dodo, and then uh, later on Monkey Pants, the, the kid in the institution. And I knew kids like Dodo and Monkey Pants. I knew them. I, I know what a kid with cerebral palsy looks and sounds like. I mean, people who are disabled or differently able, in their fingernail, they hold more experience and wisdom sometimes than most of why, us. Why is that? Because they spend their life watching. Being disabled is a little bit like being black, you know, where, you, where, where you know, you're like a witness to your own lynching, where everyone gets to make a speech about you but you. Mm. So you're there in a wheelchair and they're talking over your head. Oh, well, she wants to go, you know, but she doesn't like me. While in your mind, you're saying, you know, why you have a bug in your nose, that one, and spits flying out your mouth. And they're telling me, you know, you know, because you, you see it all. And when you're, when you're working with kids, they let you know. You know, I remember Joe Frazier came to visit the camp one time. The, you know, the heavyweight boxer. 
And he went up to one of the kids and he was like, hey, little sonny, you know, and this kid said to him, he looked up and he said, I could kick your ass. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this kind of stuff up. Right. <laughs> so, you know, when you, <laughs> if your job is to find the humanity in people, look to the differently able. That's why their parents are, have a special shine. Of course, they, you know, and you, you, they have difficulty. I was talking to, about, you know, one of your, one of your ex-colleagues who uh, writes for the Post, um, I forgot his last name. He's the book reviewer. I can't remember his last name. Charles? Ron Ron Charles? Ron Charles. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa Charles, his daughter, and the struggles that he had to raise her. And how, and this guy, he's one of the heroes. He's walking around here, him and his wife. These are the people that are the, the heroes in my world. That was James McBride talking to NPR's Michelle Martin. This interview was recorded at the National Book Festival hosted by the Library of Congress. You can find more interviews from the National Book Fest at loc.gov slash bookfest. And uh, that's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookoftheday at npr.org. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Chloe Weiner and edited by Sierra Crawford. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. Show elements for this week were produced and edited by Samantha Balde, Will Jarvis, Natalie Winston, Phil Harrell, Adriana Gallardo, Shannon Rhodes, Andrew Craig, and Dee Parvaz. And a special shout-out to Andy Huther. Uh, Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Support for NPR and the following message come from Rosetta Stone, the perfect app to achieve your language learning goals no matter how busy your schedule gets. It's designed to maximize study time with immersive 10-minute lessons and audio practice for your commute. Plus, tailor your learning plan for specific objectives like travel. Get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off and unlimited access to 25 language courses. Learn more at rosettastone.com slash NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Viore, a new perspective on performance apparel. Check out the latest Dream Knit collection by visiting viore.com slash NPR for 20% off your first purchase. Exclusions apply. Visit the website for full terms and conditions.